Okay. So the topic is to speak about a topic that the audience don't know much about, um, to engage with the audience. Switch your mind into visualization. It's 10 o'clock at night. It's pitch black. You're in the Lodderdurk State Forest. It is like zero degrees. There's a group of you all stood around this little fire, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting. You're waiting for hours. And you're waiting for a set of lights to come over Mount Blackwood. You're stood at a checking point of a race called DU-135. But before we go on, I want to know why we're at DU-135. Let's go back three months. Three months prior, I had a big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG. Do we all have big, hairy, audacious goals? People are aware of these, don't they? And sometimes you achieve them and sometimes you don't. But I made it a really important mission of mine to achieve this one, this big, hairy, audacious goal. Because my mother had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. So I thought, I have to do something. If that's hard work, there can't be anything much more hard work than that. What can I do? At the time, I wanted to run a 100-mile race. A 100-mile race is a set target point in a, ru in, a, in a running calendar. Anyone who's a runner would like to get to 100 miles, which is 164 kilometers. Um, and it's called ultra running. Now, you've all heard of ultra running. I'm guessing you've all heard of ultra athletes. People put me in that category. I don't like being categorized like that. But if you look at what I've done, it would probably put me in as an ultra runner. So what happened on that day? Well, I'm going to tell you about this race, DU135. It is Australia's gnarliest, or the Southern Hemisphere's gnarliest foot race. It is brutal. It is a... DU135, 135 is 135 miles, 217 kilometers long, and you've got to do it in one hit. But here are the stats. I'm going to give you the stats of this race that I did. I did attempt it. I didn't finish it. The numbers are astounding when some people say you ran 164 kilometers, but when you think about the other numbers that are involved there, I'm going to show them to you today. Okay. So I put all my mark pens away, so I hope this is on. So as I said, I did... 164 kilometers. The race itself is 217K. That is four marathons. I did four marathons, one after the other after the other, until I could go no further, did the pole drop, said I'm out. I still had another marathon to go. That distance there, when you think about 164, this is Melbourne. 164 kilometers out from Frankston is this line here. So we're out beyond, no, it's 217, sorry. This is my distance. So my distance is running from Frankston to Ballarat. Straight line. Shepparton, Mount Buller, Sail. But we can't go in a straight line, can we? We always have to travel by roads, it's duck and dive. So if we were traveling out from Frankston and we were doing 164 kilometers, we would get out via the way to Rosedale if we were driving. Another place we're all familiar with, Bonny Doon. So it's like setting off from Frankston and finishing at Bonny Doon. That's just off my race, not the big race. Uh, from here to Seymour and from here to Castlemaine. So them are the distances that I was running on the day of this race. Now, you can see this big circle here of to the, the crow flies. You can also see these zigzags here, which is how you would drive to them. I did all this in a little place called the Lerderdurg State Forest and the Wombat State Forest. And that was zigzagged all the way through from Bacchus Marsh to Dalesford and back again. And I did 164 kilometers in that space. It was only a tiny little space. If we look at the duration of that race, I ran nonstop for 38 hours. 38 hours nonstop, day, night, kept going. I had a crew of people feeding me. Now, if you think about 38 hours of constant travel, if you were, say, in a car, you can get in 38 hours to Perth. If you went in the other direction and you had 38 hours, and if you haven't seen it already, you can get to Port Douglas in 38 hours driving non-stop. So while I'm running non-stop, you can get to these two places by car. At the same time, it took me just to run from there to there and back again. 
It's a fairly big distance as we're talking about traveling around Australia here. Okay. Next up, elevation. Now this one I didn't really think about until I just prepared this speech. Elevation is the killer. So I've got some mountains down at the bottom here. Some of them you'll be aware of. Let's see. So Mount Kosciuszko. We know Mount Kosciuszko here in Australia. It's Australia's highest mount pe mountain peak at 2,220 feet meters high. Um, mount Kia. So I'm going into different continents here. So this is actually in Hawaii. I don't know if anyone's heard of that one. Mount Kia in Hawaii. So I'm going through the co some continents. That's 4,205 meters high. Mount um, Elbrus. Has anyone heard of Mount Elbrus? Which continent that one is in? Okay, that's in Europe. That's Europe's highest mountain, Mount Elbrus, at 5,642 meters high. Kilimanjaro at 5895, Africa. Highest mountain in Africa. Then we start going over to the North America. The highest there is Mount McKinney, which is 6,174, I think I've written there. So we're getting quite high here. We're getting all the way to what is the world's highest mountain. This is in North America. In South America, your little favorite uh, domain, is Aconcua, Aconcuga, which is 6,962 meters high. So these things are getting very, very big. All the way up to Mount Everest, 8,848 meters tall. Okay, how did I compare with these mountains? Well, I went way past, way past here. Let's keep going. Went way past here, way past here, way past here. This race in this tiny little space was going up and down gorges and valleys all over the place. By the time I'd dropped the mic and quit at 164 kilometers, I had done 7,222 meters of elevation climbing. So I was just below Mount Everest and above Aconcagua in South America. The race itself, had I gone to 217 kilometers, went to 9,091 meters high. So these are the races, so these are the stats, and these are the numbers that were thrown at us in this race, in a 38-hour race. And 50 people are allowed to enter this race only because it's too strategic. It's technically, it's too difficult to be out there with so many people. I was in the top 10 and I finished, and there's only five finished out of it. It's like a, the attrition rate is appalling. So I said earlier on, why did I ask people to do that? And I said it was because it was a BHAG of mine. I wanted to create, I wanted to get this 100 miler, which is 164 kilometers. And I achieved that on the day, which is really lucky. But why were those other people there? Well, they were there to support me. And there was 12 people supporting me on that night, on, that, on those days. It was also because of friendship, because they were all my friends, people who I run with, people who I work with. They were all helping me. And then I would say there was love, but there was love as friends, but there's also my wife. My wife was there, and she loved me, and she would support me everywhere I go. But more than that, what happened was, because I had to do it for breast cancer awareness, without realizing how much I'd heard, well, learned, um, what do you call it? Um, what do you call it when you? Sponsorship. Sponsorship. We raised over $10,000 for the McGrath Foundation for um, breast cancer awareness here. Now, that wouldn't go to my mother because she's in Portugal, but it went to this country here in the hope that something can be done about it. So there you go. That wraps it up. Why did I do that? What is the difference between an ultra runner and you get your actual facts and figures on the board or on the walls? Those are the numbers. I hope that brings home some of the facts that these ultra runners have to go through. And I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. I just wanted somebody to know or people to know that's what goes on when you put your running shoes on in the ultra world. Peace, guys.